Hello. Um, that's me. I had hair. I liked Toblerone. The world was like this great new place. And my mom always bought me chocolate on a plane. Jeff's just told you this stuff, basically. I'm a, I'm, I started learning design in a print shop, um, mostly by being shouted at. Any of you guys that old? OK, all right. Um, so my version of design was pasting things around, taking photos, photo lettering, that kind of stuff. Um, I, I, along the way on that journey, um, the web became kind of like an obsession a long, long time ago. Um, and I want to take you back to a day in 2002. I was 29 years old. I was in my home office. I had this 19-inch, I mean 19-inch CRT Sony Trinitron monitor that was so big it couldn't get on my desk. I had to put it on the table on the side. And I thought I was a captain of the Starship Enterprise. And on that day in October 2002, something launched. And it was this. Any of you guys remember this? Give me a hand if you do. If you're old like me, make me feel like I'm still part of the universe. OK. <laughs> Wide news, right? I mean, this is a sort of Doug Bowman's opus to the world. Before this, the only big site, um, well traffic site in the, on the whole web that I'd seen that was in any way standards compliant or even tried to be was the University of Salford. Um, obviously, so many people went there to that site on a daily basis. It was very popular. So Wired was really like the first one that kind of did this thing. Now, you've got to understand that at that time, this environment that Wired was launching into was completely adverse. It was like, a, I don't know, it was like firing Jeffrey out of a cannon onto the surface of Mars, right? You know, I mean, standards just was really not an easy thing to try and deliver into a browser at all. And Wired especially because it had ads, right? No one controls the content from ad networks. So actually, I mean, truthfully, it wasn't standards compliant because, you know, you try to validate this thing, which we all did because we were enthusiasts, right? We were like, oh, someone launched a site, you know, let, let's go see if it's valid. And there was like three errors, so you send them an email because it's polite. <laughs> Sometimes. Uh, and, but it wouldn't. But I saw this, and actually, as a designer, I just thought, man, what a job you did. You know, different areas of the site had different colors. You know, you embraced the pixelization. That, that, I mean, you've got to bear in mind that Windows at the time only had pixelated fonts. Right? Really. Um, especially at small sizes. Weirdly, as they got bigger, they, had, they, they kind of smoothed out a little bit. So I'm, like, losing it. I'm super happy. This is my very, very articulate reaction. But other people have better reactions. Um, the article in Wired that talked about it actually said something about standards, right? It's pretty cool. Um, and, the, and the really important bit of this, of course, is, first of all, that this article is still there on the web. This is 16 years later. That is not a common thing on big sites these days. And then a guy called Eric Meyer, who you might have heard of, that guy, he, uh, he had something to say. He was interviewed for the Wired article. And he said this thing, right, which is really important. Now, you know, the, the markup that now drives the site will be a great deal easier to maintain. Anybody write, write tables code one here? Anybody write a lot of tables code? Anybody write a lot of TDs, TRs? Anybody? Yeah, yeah, OK. All right, anybody still in slight degree of pain from that? Anybody do it, and then the next day, a client, a boss, a colleague will come to you and say, hey, could we just rearrange this whole thing? And you died a little inside. Shed a tear, called your mom. Said, mom, get me out of here. This is terrible. OK, so this is kind of important, right? And then a guy called you know, um, Jeff Zalbin had something to say about it, too. Um, and he kind of hit the nail on the head, really, because what we were looking for at that time was the ability to make an argument. How many of you guys work in a big company? And by big, I mean a company of more than 500 employees. OK, all right, so a good chunk of you. How many of you work in a company of more than 50? Most of the rest. OK, 
So you know how hard it is to make an argument inside of that kind of environment, right? You know how hard it is to stand in front of stakeholders and try and make an argument for a certain kind of technology or a certain way of doing things. So anybody who gives you a little bit of ammunition, you know, you love. Anybody who gives you an argument that you can make that might be heard by a boss or another colleague, that might be able to convince other people to come with you on a, on a journey you want to take with technology or with design generally, that's really important. So Jeff nailed it with that. So just summarizing this, this is like no more go slow to load pages and web design has gone mad, easier to maintain, and why I did it already. So it was this really great moment. Um, so just 16 years later, it's, it's 2018, of course, here I am. And this is how kind of some basic stuff has changed. So when I was 29, I was one of 587 million or thereabouts. Now we are part of 4.1 billion. Connection speed has changed so dramatically, I, you know, it's really hard to conceive what those numbers actually mean. So I thought I'll do, a, you know, as a guy who does type stuff, I thought I'll do this. I'll typeset 0.15 megabits, and then I'll try and typeset what that is relative to 102, and it's 680 times different. That's pretty, that's pretty amazing. So, okay, so we've got all this, so all this amazing stuff has happened, it's great. Yeah, isn't it? And, uh, but then, you know, I mean, is it? Oh, I'm just, I'm going. I'm, oh, God, there you are. That's real time, by the way, I did not play with that. I, I swear to God, I didn't touch it. But what you, did you see what happened though? Do you see that the actual, the actual, um, URL returned really fast, right? The usual milliseconds. And then the browser's trying to render this thing. Now, all that bandwidth to play with, and, and you know, that's what Uniqlo are gonna give me when I'm trying to buy fleeces for my kids. So, then I, in the same day, I was noticing that, I got, I got this email. So I'd done this thing, I'd spent money, right? And when you spend money, if something goes wrong in the process of spending money, you have a little twinge of anxiety. So something went wrong, so I, I emailed, it. I emailed this guy, these guys and I said, hey, did, you, did that transaction complete? And I got this back. And I was like, man, I, I, really, it's, it's like, it's 2018. It is not, it's not 1998, 99. It's not 2000, 2001. I mean, replace Chrome with, with Internet Explorer, replace with Netscape for crying out loud. And, you know, you might as well, time, no time might have passed at all. So, I just was like, that was my reply. Okay, that's what Adam got back. Because, you know, so, this alluded to a thought that I've been having about, um, you know, what we do as designers, right? And, and, and for me, it's about entropy. I like creating it as a designer, rather than doing anything, you know, useful. I'm not, I, I joke. Um, because I thought maybe this is just another bit of entry, right? And it's the sort of thing we should be able to be able to solve with design. Because for me, I'm still trying to mitigate entry. I'm still trying to stop things turning to, I'm um, trying to think of a word that's not shit, um, rubbish, <laughs> crap. <laughs> okay. I'm still trying to do that as a designer. That's kind of see what is one of my main jobs is to try and make sure things don't turn horrible. And then, after I've done that, a little bit of defense, I've stood there with my shield and gone like, no, you can't, you can't do that. Then I try and make this a little bit better, if I can. So how have we got to this point? Mm. Well, with all this processing power, um, all this power generally, all this skill, all these sort of thousands and thousands of hours that we put in developing tools and developing techniques and developing everything else, how have we got to this point where I'm getting an email from Adam saying, oh, dude, you know, you need to use Chrome and where Uniqlo is taking 10 seconds just to render their homepage in, in, my, in my browser, which is three years old. So here's a question for you. Up until last week, I had a phone which was like, a, like four and a half years old, almost five. Who else, has got a, who else has got a phone or just recently had a phone of that kind of age? Okay. Like, don't be ashamed, because like, I was quite happy to hold on to mine. If my youngest child hadn't have been moaning at me constantly for around about three months, I probably would have just held on to it. And as it is, I gave it to him. When we live in a world where you can't have technology which is three or four years old, um, because 
someone somewhere is designing and building things that don't, won't work very well on that platform, I think we've got a problem. And, and I'm really curious of how we, how we came to that point. Because it's all about quality of life, right? And the, and, the, and the age of your phone should not determine the quality of your life. You should be able to wander around the world with a Nokia feature phone and still not be unhappy. I think that should be an inalienable right somewhere written down. You're allowed to have an older, as old a phone or laptop or desktop as you like and, and be okay. So I want to take you back to a long, long time ago because when I was in my, having my design education by being shouted at in the print shop, at the same time, I was really, really curious about why in the print shop I was being shouted out for not doing something a certain way. And at that time, um, you could be an apprentice still. That's how old I am, right? Um, and you'd serve a five-year apprenticeship. And uh, during that apprenticeship, you'd be taught the techniques that you needed in order to be a printer. And these techniques were set in stone, right? You had to do it this way. This is the way you did it. It was, it was chapter and verse. We don't have that on the web. We've never had it, that on the web, actually. And in fact, that's kind of like part of the problem and part of the great beauty of it. It's the fact there's a million ways of doing it. You can be technically, technically agnostic and still work in this business and, and change your solution every time you do something if you want to. So what we need, actually, is um, some other kind of principles to guide us when we're making decisions, right? We need some other kind of overarching idea of why we're going to make a decision in a certain direction, how we're going to evaluate technology if we're going to change the in that, how we're going to actually change the, change the route that we take in order to deliver the experience that we want to, to, to our audience. And 100 years ago, people were, still, were also grappling with a similar kind of problem, right? Because 100 years ago, or thereabouts, there's this great revolution taking place in design, architecture, art, and society generally. You know, it's, ju it's just before the First World War. There's this idea that, hey, maybe good stuff should be for everybody. Maybe you shouldn't have to be rich to have something that works well. And as that's going on, you've got artists on the fringe of it, like Picasso, uh, coming up with things like this, which is still life with chair caning, which is a hell of a mouthful. And he must blatantly have been drunk when he named this, this piece of work. Because two reasons. One, this is the very first collage of the modern era and it was the very first thing to be called a collage. Before this, that word wasn't used in this context at all. Secondly, it's the very first mixed media piece of art. And it's mixed media because around the outside of it is rope. And the chair caning bit that you can see on the left bottom isn't actually chair caning at all. That is a piece of material printed to look like chair caning that you would then put on a chair so that someone sitting on it or looking at it would think that it was a little bit more posh than it was. And the, and the reason it's an oval shape is because Picasso, what he's actually doing is here, he's constructing an image as if you're sitting at a round glass top table looking through it and looking at what's on it. So in this mixed media piece of work is allegedly, I mean, you guys might see more than me, to be fair, um, a knife, um, some lemon, teacup, um, there's definitely a paper called the journal, which is a, a Parisian paper at the time, and the chair caning bit. Now, the reason that this is kind of important is because it started a kind of aesthetic or a, a commentary. You know, like art critics love to kind of get involved. Like, we you know, Banksy sells a picture that starts shredding itself at, for over a million pounds, and, you know, everyone wants to talk about that, right? Which is kind of funny. He's, a, he's from my hometown. Um, some of his work hangs outside my studio. Occasionally, someone runs past and throws paint at it, because that's how we do things in Bristol. So we ent we're fully entertained. So art critics love to kind of get involved and like talk about stuff, and you know, it's great. But the reason this is important is because it spawned the collage aesthetic, and what that did is that changed the way that people started to tell stories, and this directly affects, I mean, I know this seems esoteric, but it directly affects how we work on the web today. Because it changed, for example, embryonic film storytelling. Before this, and before this kind of collage aesthetic movement, if you painted, you painted. It was 2D, it was on canvas, that's what you did. Okay, you might do it on board, but you used paint. You didn't start chucking feathers at it and weird cane print chair stuff. And you didn't do that, you were a painter. If you were an actor, you appeared in a box with one open side on a stage, and that was your medium by which to express yourself. 
all of the, most of the artistic kind of endeavors at that time were, were kind of contained. But then film took inspiration from this, lots of other people took inspiration from this and started to think about, okay, maybe when we've got a film running, we can have a shot where we have a shot of a family at a table, and then we cut to the son of that family on the battlefield, and then we cut back to the table, and then we have this mixed narrative going on. Kind of started by this, really, in a way. So at the time, at the same time that Picasso is kind of doing all this sort of stuff as a commentary on information, because that's what it says, it's a commentary on information, you've got like a load of modernists hanging around all over the place, thinking up how they can get involved in this kind of revolution. And one of them is this guy. Do you know him? Anybody know him? Not personally, obviously. OK, Peter Behrens. This guy uh, was the, an artistic consultant, which is a weird title for AEG. He was employed from 1907 by AEG, and he was the first combined product, industrial, graphic, architectural, packaging. He was the first modern designer, really. He did all of that for AEG. He, he hand-drew, hand-lettered a typeface for them, changed, he changed their, their identity to this. He created the very first complex corporate identity for AEG. On the left, 1908, on the right, 1912. So he's doing this at the same time as Picasso's doing his weird stuff, right? But it's important because there, from here comes a lot of other stuff. And this is, where we're, this is the journey we're taking today. He also designed this, this stuff for AEG. It's kind of cool, man. I, can't, I want the final. I actually can't want both of them. If you see any of these in a junk shop, will you buy, me, buy it and just email me? And, and I'll give you money. Hmm? I have one like that in my garage. Oh, thank you. That's very kind of you. I'll pick it up later. So many people are so generous, man. So cool. And then he also did this kind of stuff. This is the part of the complex corporate identity stuff. So this guy, Peter Behrens, what he is, he's an architect, actually, but he's interested in this idea. He's interested in this idea that you can... Um, create a homogenous identity based on a set of principles inside of a company like AEG. He also built a turbine hall for them, which is like this huge building, concrete, steel, and glass. I don't know what happened to that slide. I must have lost it. Anyway, uh, he also designed that building for him, which is like a revolutionary building made out of steel and glass that's still standing today. And I recommend you go and see it because it's amazing to stand in and think this is 100 years ago and some guy designed this. It could be now. He was one of the founders of an organization called the Deutsche Werkbund. And these guys are really important. Deutsche Werkbund was founded in 1907. And what the idea was is that this revolutionary time, I'm going to tie all this together with us, don't worry. Bear with me. At uh, this revolutionary time, Deutsche Werkbund, we're dealing with the consequences of mass production. For the first time, serious mass production was a thing. And they were concerned with quality. They wanted to bring high quality, really well-designed stuff to everybody. So they knew a lot of craftsmen. They were craftsmen themselves. They were inspired by the arts and crafts movement in the UK with William Morris. They wanted to take that craft, that skill, that idea of quality, mash it together with mass production and produce something good and make it available to everybody. That's pretty cool, right? So Deutsche Werkbund used to produce these um, different booklets showing their different work. And you can see here the transition that's happening in design. Before this, we've got Art Nouveau. Art Nouveau is all about the natural form. It looks kind of like, you know, like Alron's joint, you know, Al, um, um, or like something out of Lord of the Rings to do with, that, do with the Eldar. Art Nouveau, super decorative and pretty. And then you're moving towards modernism, and you can see it alluded to here. Also, this guy, Mies van der Rohe, architect, apprentice to Behrens, architectural director of Deutsche Werkbund, also the last director of the Bauhaus until 1932, when it was basically forced to close by Hitler. This guy was Behrens' apprentice. This guy also believed in this idea of distributing the best things to everybody. And he also had this idea there's an argument that Picasso's chair caning also spawned a load of ideas in architecture. So the Barcelona Pavilion. This is actually a reproduction. The original was torn down, but van der Rohe designed this in uh, 1929. 
And it, and it encapsulates, again, some of this ideas from Picasso, some of this ideas of mass production and, and, and the industrial world, the steel and the glass and everything else. And then also juxtaposed with this multimedia message about the natural world with natural materials. Honest materials, right? This isn't concrete painted to look like stone. Okay? This isn't plastic made to look like steel. Okay? This is steel, this is stone. It's really important, these kind of ideas for them. And this is what it was like inside it. And on the right-hand side there, you can see the Barcelona chair, which you probably all know because you can't visit anywhere on the internet which, is, which calls itself a design site without at least one article about the Barcelona chair. But again, the Barcelona chair there on the right-hand side, uh, which Van der Rohe designed and built with Lily Reich. Everyone's got to have engineers around them and other people. I'm just going to say that. Lily needs a bit more credit than she gets. It's sitting on wool felt. So it's sitting on a natural material which has been around for hundreds of thousands of years and human beings have always used, and you've got this steel frame chair sitting on top of it. And this isn't accidental. This is all directly from Picasso's lineage. And also, just because we're in the States, we should talk about falling water too. Because falling water does exactly the same thing just a little bit later. It's all right, Frank, he was a little bit behind the time, but you know, he's catching up. <laughs> Okay, now we always see the outside of falling water, right? Because it's very dramatic. There's the water, there's the concrete, there's the suspension, it's great. There's the cantilevered kind of house sitting over the top of it. But on the inside, it's kind of really interesting too, because what you can see is, again, the glass, a bit of wood, a bit of steel. But you see that big stone on the right, which someone's definitely stubbed their toe on a multitude of times. <laughs> Sorry, man, if that was in my house. <laughs> Frank's doing this deliberately. What he's doing is he's got this idea that human beings are still human beings. At the core of us, we still have the same kind of things that we aspire to, effectively living in a cave. You know, we have man caves and blah, 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 but we like the coziness of that. It's familiar to us. It's a human scale. These things are human scale. So he left the natural stuff in there. There's huge amounts of natural, authentic material alongside the steel and glass. So... What they're looking for here is harmony between two things. Now, to us, we look at it, and it's so familiar, because we grew up around all this sort of stuff, that we don't notice easily those jarring, sometimes, juxtapositions. But they aren't, they're deliberately there, and they're there to supposedly be harmonious. It's about alluding to who is this design for? And this is a really important question for us, right? Who is our work for? It's obviously for an audience. It's obviously for human beings. That's what they're thinking. None, none, of the, none of the faux grandeur of the late Victorian era here. So you've got these inspirational people, Peter Behrens, Mies van der Rohe, and then chuck in, you know, the Eames, just for the hell of it, because Ray and Charles, and then, you know, Dieter Rams. And you could even, if I was going to be really generous, chuck in Johnny Ive on the end of there as well. And they all come from the same lineage of modernism. Except there's a problem along the way, right? That thing, that thing, that entropy. And we've got it. We've got the same problem, I think, on the web. Because, you know, this, this is what we've got, right? You want a Barcelona chair, a real one, authentic one, produced by the people who are licensed to still produce this design, it's $6,000. You want a real Eames chair, produced by the people who are licensed to produce that design and don't make it in China, $500. And, and on the end is uh, Visto's Awesome modular shelving. You can keep expanding this for your entire lifetime. But that little piece is $1,183. I would cry if I had to hand that over in cash. I would. And then this is where we've kind of fallen down, right, culturally. This great modernist dream of good stuff for everybody is dying right there on that screen at $6,000 for a Barcelona chair and $500 for an Eames chair made out of not even um, the, uh, the original fiberglass. So I, I was sort of thinking about all these things, and, and, and this is where my brain takes me. And I was thinking about the web, and I was thinking about, um, for, the, for a bunch of time now, about how our work has got much more complicated. Our tooling has got more complicated. The level of access that we're granting has got more complicated to give about how we have gone from 2002, where things were hard, but you could still do them, where Doug and two engineers produced that entire website for Wired News, 
to an era now where I'm coming across teams of 10, 20, 50 people working on internet products and then making me wait 10 seconds so I can see a shirt. So I, I don't want to say, I'm not going to point fingers at anybody in particular. And if there's anybody here who works for Uniqlo, I'll buy you a beer after because I'm being mean. But it's a problem, right? And how do we get there and what do we do about it? So for me, I can only answer for me from a personal point of view. Again, I come back to these principles. I need to imbue my work and my decision making with a set of principles. Otherwise, I'm just lost, you know, just kind of reacting to what's going on at any given time. So my principles is what this talks about, which is durable, inclusive, and aesthetic design. This is how I summed it up in my head as like my own personal vision statement. You guys, who, who, anybody here, UX designer, writes vision statements all the time? Kind of likes doing it? One, two, three, okay. So I find them really useful when they're done really well. In fact, I find, I find corporate bylines and like strap lines really, really cool when they're done really well. It kind of reminds me, like the one of my favorites was uh, Hotels.com. It had Wake Up Happy. I was like, oh, that's so good. So good. Have you got a bonus for that? So this was mine. So what does durable actually mean? I mean, this is a dictionary definition. It's be able to withstand wear, pressure, or damage, and it's hard wearing. Okay? But it has to operate in, in the context of where we are now, which is in what people have decided to call the attention economy. Okay? So the attention economy was a, a phrase that was really coined in 1969 or thereabouts in a paper by Herbert A. Simon, who started talking about it first. He said information consumes attention of its recipients. It demands from us cognitive processing. Okay? And then it was refined a little bit by Matthew Crawford. 2015, he said, it, it's a, it's a, he's basically saying attention is a finite resource. We've only got so much we can give. Therefore, our audience only has so much they can give. So when we've got these multimedia, just to use a phrase that's been used recently to describe Picasso's work, multimedia, uh, complex narratives, impactful narratives being chucked out there in order to get, get people's attention, get our attention, in order to do anything, really, sell everything, it's a problem. And when we're designing, the, the thing that always stays with me, or one of the things that stays with me alongside these principles of mine, is that usually we're designing for one of two contexts. This is especially true with type, by the way. So I'm kind of drawing on typography here, just to kind of the way I think about type in order to the way I think about interfaces too, and about web delivery generally. We're either designing for impact or we're designing for immersion. And impact, this is when my kids were cute, by the way. They don't look like that anymore. And, and, and if anybody finds them hanging around like that, just give them to me. Um, impact is a marked effect on influence, right? It's a marked, marked effect or influence that it demands your attention, it wants to be heard, it wants you to look at it. And immersion is a deep mental involvement in something. So impact is like looking at advertising, I guess, seeing a billboard, and immersion is like reading a book. Let's just keep it really, really nice and simple. Or getting lost in Wikipedia at 1 a.m. and then waking up and deciding it's 3 a.m. and crap, you've got to get up at 4 and get a flight. Um, that never happened to me. Um, so we're usually designing, designing for one of those two contexts. And I think what are the, one of the problems we've got at the moment, or one of the things I observe is there's a lot of designing for impact going on because of the attention economy, because people who are involved in the decision making of what kind of work we're producing want to get some attention on it. And by wanting the attention, they're using what they consider to be the most sophisticated tools or approaches that they have, which is to have us, have us design and build for impact. Right? And impact is, by its very nature, always going to be a little bit heavier, a little bit more unwieldy. There's more stuff going on. But the whole point about impact is that you can have impact with a gentle interruption, right? I don't know, have you ever done that thing where you're having a, like a, a rant, kind of slightly losing it in the kitchen, and your significant other comes up and just kind of touches you on the shoulder, and you're like, oh, okay, yeah, sorry. I was kind of losing it there for a second. Or they, some, while someone interrupts you gently, gets you to change your behavior slightly, or gets you to stop doing what you're doing. So interruption can be gentle like that. It can be very useful if it's done right, but also accidental disruptions, like the typesetting example there, you know, are just annoying. And that happens all the time to me reading Kindle books. I don't know if you guys read Kindle books and some of them are so badly formatted, you kind of want to throw them away, but they're all on a Kindle. So if you throw it away, you throw your Kindle away at the same time, and that's a really bad thing to do, especially on a plane. 
But deliberate interruptions, right, can be good, right? I really like this. I really wish I'd driven through this. And I know it's dumb, but <laughs> it's for a, an all-you-can-eat rest stop called Old Timer in Austria. Nailed it. <laughs> right, but other kind of interruptions don't get the right tone, yeah? <laughs> other kind of disruptions, like, they just don't get it right, and then they annoy people. <laughs> I did not do that. My hand is way, ne is way neater than that, I'm just saying. And then other things invite you to interact with them, and you know, they, you then have surprising things happen. What did Josh do, right? Did he turn up with a cherry picker? Did he like, have a friend come? There's like four of them like, holding a ladder. What was going on? What did he... oh, you've got to love Josh, man. Who are, where are you, Josh, now? We need you, man. We do. So when we've got this stuff going on about impact and, 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 and how we handle that, how we get attention, what I'm saying is that we have to be very careful, I think, about how this is done. And when Uniqlo are loading up their page on the front end and like my three-year-old machine is failing miserably to, 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 to render it in, inside of 10 seconds, they're doing that probably for the best of intentions. They want to do something with there, but I've got no idea what it is. I can't even see it to actually tell what it is, right? So they've interrupted me in the worst possible way. And there's another little tool that I use to think about um, design generally, which is narrative. And Great guy, uh, wrote some stuff about narrative. Um, uh, what's his name? Jenkins, his name is a professor at MIT. And he, he basically was discussing about games. And he said in games, there's a couple of, couple of main types of enacted narratives. And automatically a light bulb went in, off in my head, that's a checkout. An enacted narrative is when I need to follow a certain number of steps in order to do something. That's what we design, an enacted narrative. And interruptions, disruptions can help or hinder that process. And then there's emergent narratives. Spaces that are designed to be ripe with opportunity for us. I guess you could think of social, social networks in that way, but I, my personal favorite is think of maps. I love maps. And I, can just, I, I love that I can just go on, 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 on Google Maps and just go and wander around the world. And if ever Google Maps becomes fully, properly augmented, um, I probably won't leave the house for a couple of weeks as I go on my little wall tour. But again, in, in thinking about it in terms of enacted narratives and emergent narratives, emergent narrative could also be a browsing space, like, for example, a shop, like a store, where you're browsing through different products. And it's giving you clues to go and look at other stuff, to go on little journeys, to read here, to discover this, to discover that. And you're building your own story about this brand and this, this interaction that you're having. And it's useful for me to think about that in terms of an emergent narrative or an, and then an enacted narrative that's at the end where you go and check out. So the other, one of the other principles here is, is, is the idea of inclusivity, being inclusive, leaving no one behind. And also included in this is colleagues. Um, because you can't exclude colleagues either when you're trying to be inclusive. It's not fair. Because bad things happen, right? I love this. I could just, could just watch this for a bit. If you don't mind, anyway. I just. Oh, Hulk. Anyway, you can't leave them behind, your colleagues. I actually like that too. If anybody's got that lamp, I'll have that as well. <laughs> um, and the reason I say this is because we're still in this era where I, I come across it all the time, and some of you guys probably you know, don't, or hopefully you don't work in this way. I come across this all the time where things get thrown over fences, you know? I mean, Dan's going to come and talk about this in a bit um, after me, so I'm not going to get into it. But, you know, stuff gets, you know, designers do something, they throw it over the fence of somebody else to, to, to front-end devs and to, to, to back-end devs and to all sorts of different people. Then they do something, they throw it back, and there's this whole kind of game of ping-pong going on, which, but it's not fun ping-pong. It's like really frustrating, annoying ping pong. And this thing called amends. Amends is what I hear a lot in my studio. Oh, you know, we've got lots of amends. And I was thinking, well, when I, when I was training, when I was sort of getting my crash course in, de in design in the print shop, that wasn't amends. That's when you'd messed it up. It's not an amend. So, so what does that mean, messing it up? Well, that means that I had not, I had not taken on board the instructions that were given to me to print this job. Okay. And actually, what that meant is I'd, I'd not read the instructions properly, therefore I'd not gone and asked the right questions. So therefore, I'd not been involved, I've not been included in the process of when these instructions were generated. So I've never, ever, ever had a decent day 
uh, on a project where I haven't actually been involved with everyone else in that project in some kind of way in the free flow of information. So if we're still working in this way where we're throwing things over fences, I think that's part of the problem why we're, we're the 10 second load on Uniqlo. You can see I'm really upset by that, obviously. So what we try and do is we try and figure out, one of the things we try and do is figure out who our customers are so we can try and deliver to them what they are looking for, right, and ask that question. So um, one of the ways we do this is like by gathering loads of data and doing loads of analysis. And being a statistician is super cool, so whatever they say, I'm all automatically believe for about 30 seconds. And then, but you know, a lot of, a lot of people that I've spoken to, a lot of clients of mine have said, we know who our audience is, we know who our customers are. I'm like, oh, really? Okay, I don't believe you. Because the world is like a complicated place, right? And this is what I think, and this is my polemic, that there aren't any edge cases. There's just people trying to live their life in contexts that we haven't understood yet. And I get really, really annoyed when people start talking to me about edge cases. Because I'm like, I'm, I'm like, okay, edge cases are fine as long as you're not one. So I'm an edge case this week. This machine here, this machine that's pretty new, like a few days old, it crashed yesterday completely, utterly. The startup disk crashed. My talk was on it. I was like, oh man, I am screwed. Um, so I called Apple. Uh, no, actually, first of all, I went on the website and I, I put in my details and I put my phone number in and it said, oh, your phone number's not valid. I was like, okay. So I got in the chat and I was like, Hey, you know, this has happened. Could you help me? Um, could you ask someone to give me a call? And then the answer was, I'm sorry, but UK support is closed. Well, I'm like, yeah, but I'm in Florida. It's like, well, no, because you obviously bought the machine in the UK. It's closed. I'm like, okay. Well, um, in that case, then, um, I'm American. I just happened to buy a machine in the UK. Could you call my hotel room? No. Can't do that either. Oh. So at that point, I am an edge case, right? Like, okay, we'll help you over chat. I'm like, cool, okay. Have you done this? Yes. Have you done that? Yes. Have you done the other? Yes. Uh, okay. I said, okay, can I just go to an Apple store and get this fixed? Because I really have got to give a talk tomorrow. And I'm sure there's lots of people who don't care one way or the other, but I'm pr I'll be pretty bothered. No. You, well, you can, but we can get an appointment on Friday. I'm like, no, no, dude. I'm giving a talk tomorrow, man, and I'm trying not to get upset on the chat, right? Because the only way you can get upset on the chat is by being a bit snippy. And he's like, well, okay, I can get you an appointment today. I'm like, oh, cool, where? 53 miles away. I'm like, where's that then? Oh, Tallahassee? I'm like, is that, is, is that hurricane there? <laughs> I'm, so I'm like, in my head, I'm like, oh, man, bollocks, I'll fix this, fix this myself. And I did. That's why we're standing here today. But the point is, that I, I am an edge case. There's lots of people. We can all be edge cases at some point in, in, our, in our experience in life. Generally, we can all end up being an edge case. So when organizations, colleagues say to me, oh, you know, that's an edge case, I'm like, I've got no idea what you're talking about. It just means we're not doing it right. Sorry. So there's all of us on the planet. And we all come from all sorts of different places, and you know, especially in the developing world. And one of the things about the developing world is that they use technology that we've got no idea about. I mean, I did see uh, a Nokia 7110 once upon a time. I can say that's true. Um, but it's amazing. When I, when I was looking into this, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a Nokia engineer. Uh, well, sorry, a, an engineer who develops for Nokia has done for many, many years for a very big company you're going to hear about in a second. Uh, and he gave me some, pointed me some, to some stats, and I was like, whoa, really? 1.5 billion S40 phones were sold in the world between 1999 and 2012. This is just a gargantuan amount. And especially in India, which was their biggest market. There are 1.3 billion people in India. Nokia had 84%, 54% market share based on Symbian S40 feature phones mainly because people can't afford anything but feature phones at that point. Uh, 159 million Nokia 51, 5230 sold in two, 2009, excuse me. In 2018, 360 million smartphones. And I guarantee that they're not all um, iPhones. So WhatsApp is a really great story about durability, about inclusivity, to me anyway, I think. Anybody here work for WhatsApp, just before I get into this? 
Okay, all right, I can tell lies now. No, I'm joking. My friend worked, worked for WhatsApp for many years. He was, was their original Nokia developer in 2009. He, uh, he didn't want me to talk about him as his name is very shy um, and rich. Um, so WhatsApp developed, was developed for Symbian by my friend uh, because they uh, knew there was loads and loads of Nokias running Symbian S40 in, in India. And they thought, well, we can get involved in this. So in 2014, there was 50 million people using WhatsApp in India when it was sold for 19 billion. 50 million people using it. And this one guy was doing all the development for all the Nokias. That's a true story. So WhatsApp, though, what they, would, what they actually did is they had a particular approach to this. They wanted to try and support all the Nokia handsets, all the handsets running that operating system. Because in India, someone else might know this better than me. I'm getting this sort of third hand. So if you do, please shout. What, I've been, what he told me is that in India, that you have to pay for your text messages. So that's a really uneconomical way of staying in touch with people overseas by text, by SMS. So. What they wanted to do was to find a way of doing that. But you'd also have to pay for your data too, right? OK. So what they did is, their WhatsApp, so what they did is they went and talked to um, Indian network providers and said, hey, why don't we ship not WhatsApp on your, on your Nokias as a service? And why don't you include the basic data for texts, for messaging with text from WhatsApp in the plan? And what they said is, yeah, sure. There's no more bandwidth than just a bit of text. So that's what happened. And then they opened up a whole market of people who couldn't afford to be paying for the stuff that we take for granted to use a service that then connected them to all their family overseas. And what happened was that they were just trying to focus on what people were trying to do, which is speak to their friends and family overseas, mainly through WhatsApp. All they wanted to do was make sure they could send messages any way they were in the country, whether on edge connection, 3G, whether they were upside down. And they did this because they designed it with just native controls as a principle, because it was quick and fast and didn't take 10 seconds to load up, and then enhanced it, kind of like Jeremy Keith talks about with resilient web design. But what was interesting, and what the really important bit is, is that that developing world, Brazil, India, use of WhatsApp, based on this kind of principles which sum up the way that I think about design in terms of durability and being inclusive, they drove the takeoff of WhatsApp in the first world. Because you're in India, you're a farmer. You haven't got a lot of money, but you've got friends and you've got family who are living in the UK, living in Europe somewhere. You want to stay in touch, you use WhatsApp. So you say to your, your cousin, get WhatsApp. It doesn't, doesn't cost me anything. And your cousin's like, yeah, cool. So your cousin gets WhatsApp. And cousin's like, actually, this works pretty good. It's pretty cool. I'll use this. So they drove. First world use with developing world use. Exactly the opposite of how we imagine the tech business to actually work. And you've got to bear in mind, I'm sure you'll remember, WhatsApp was really disregarded at that sort of time. 2009 onwards until around about 2012, people were like, WhatsApp? Bleh. I'm not using that. WhatsApp is basically the Land Rover Defender. Oh, I love these things. Of, uh, of services. Always durable, always on, always works. And the reason I love them so much is because this is where I kind of come full circle a little bit into how we build for the web. And I know I'm not giving you loads of solid takeaways and do this technique, but I'm not going to tell you what to do. You're like grown-ups. You can make up your own mind. The reason I love these things is because you can take one of these, which is this guy. These guys, cool and vintage. They take old defenders and they make them look like that, and you can. You don't need to be an electronic engineer with a computer to, to analyze what's wrong with a, with, a, with a defender. You can get the parts, you can fix it yourself. It will keep going as long as you decide to maintain it yourself. There is a value in that for us as a species. Now, it's fine. You want to have a Lamborghini? I'm not going to argue with you. They're pretty cool. I'd borrow it. But if I want a car that I can quit working and still use, that's probably going to be the one. It has manual windows, right? Anybody ever bought a replacement electric motor for a car window? Oh my God, they're like, they're like $300, $400. It's, it's, like, it's like a crime against humanity. I'm like, dude, can I just have a windy one? And he's like, no, I'm sorry, we can't put those in. I'm like, the leather strap that you pull over the door, which has a pin that used to, used to have this leather strap that pulled the window up and it, it went into a pin and it will keep the window up. 
He's like, no, that, that's not a thing anymore. So I'm like, hate you all. Have your $400. I hope you cry alone at night. And that's why I love these sort of things. And that's the kind of web that I think sometimes we need to be thinking about how we, that we can build, one that can be fixed, one that isn't as complicated and isn't quite as trying so hard to have so much impact, one that actually has it, 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 inherently has its own beauty because of its form that is derived from its function. So when we come down to the last one, to the last word of aesthetic, I actually think this is a lie, this definition, giving or designed to give pleasure through beauty. I think it's not true because these guys did, wrote this paper. They did this bit of research, and what they found is that even if something's beautiful, it doesn't make it feel like it works better for people. Not always, not always the case. But if something works really well and you ask them after what their impressions of how good it looked are, people have a much more positive impression. That's kind of important. That means that actually usable is beautiful if you get it right in the minds of people who are important to us, which are our customers and our audience, right? That's really, really important. Because it means that rather than focusing on impact all the time, rather than having, having that, those arguments about the impact, about getting people's attention, it's got to be pretty, it's got to do, do this, that, and the other, maybe we need to focus a little bit more on immersion. Maybe we need to focus a little bit more on how things work when actually people have, yeah, you need a bit of impact to draw them in, but when they've started using it, maybe the resources need to go into that bit. And maybe, just maybe, if they do go into that bit, people will have walk away with a super favorable impression like they did with WhatsApp. And maybe at the end of it all, we kind of build things that are really useful and considered to be beautiful. And, and of course, because I'm talking about durable, inclusive design, I've got to put that bit in. And that's it. Thank you very much.